50 million for a jet or 50 million for a building that's worth 200 million. Like if you want to make sense of it, yeah. I can find a lot of things that make yeah. more sense. Putting 50 million in a business that already produces cash is worth hundreds of millions. Yeah. That's smart. The thing about love is that is what our love and our relationship looks like, is helping someone else achieve their goals and their targets. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us once again. Today, we have two great guests who many call a power couple. Their accomplishments range from his multiple real estate investments and international motivational speaking to her successful work as an author with the 2018 release of Build an Empire, How to Have It All. And to be frank with you, no introduction is sufficient enough to describe these two. So with all the pleasure, I'd like to welcome Grant and Elena Cardone. Welcome to Dubai. Welcome to the Middle East. Thank you so, so much for having us. We, we love it here. Like yeah. every time I come here, I'm, I'm so excited to get here. Like I'm literally looking out the window of the plane and Beautiful. saying, we, we were so excited. Like we flew into Manchester uh, yesterday, I guess. I mean, I love it over there, but not near the, like there's a vibe here. There's something electric here. And, and so this morning we're flying in. 30 or 45 minutes before we land, and we're just like, oh my God, we can't wait to get outside. I saw your stories on Instagram yeah, yeah, while you were yeah. looking out the window. One of the things I really admire about you guys, and this has been a dream for me, myself, is wanting to own a private jet one day because mm. my dream at one point was to get into aviation, be a pilot, and I went through the entire process until I found out one day that I was colorblind. So I was rejected, and I did not oh, know wow. about it. Wow. So that's why you always like my tie. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Isn't it the same tie that we wear all the time? Is it a different? <laughs> so eventually I was told, well, you know, work hard enough, get your own jet. You don't have to ask yeah. anybody for that. Sit in the so back. What was it like? What happened with the first one was most people buy the wrong plane first. We did, by the way. But most people buy the wrong plane first four times. So they start little, go a little bigger, go a little bigger and then finally end up in the right plane. So we, we thought, I, I started with a Phenom 100. It's a small plane, it's very fast. Looking at it, not and, and I And I played out of my mind. I mean, the, the one thing about finances is like, you, you don't want to make mistakes in finances. Like I hear a lot of people say, hey, failure's the way to learn. You can't do that over and over with big purchases. No, you get broke. Yeah. You, you know, it's great on a meme. You know, I've learned everything through my failures. Try that with real estate. You won't be buying any real estate because you're going to go broke. So try it in relationships. You can only be in so many bad relationships before you're like, I'm just not doing them anymore. And so uh, what I did was I played it out of my mind. Hey, if I bought this jet right now, how would I pay for it? Then how would I use it? And I'm like, okay, that, that plane won't work. Would you, would you consider a plane an actual investment? I would. I mean, is that how you justify it? Is it not? You don't justify it. Mean, is it an asset? You don't justify it. it. You don't okay. make sense of it. Okay. So I got a buddy trying to buy one right now. I said, dude, quit doing the math on it. It doesn't make sense. There's no way to make sense of it. It will not make sense, but if you use it right, it will make money. Right. So, but it'll never make sense. Now the question is, will you have enough discipline and work ethic to make sure it makes money? Absolutely. And making money is, hey, I'm coming to pick you up in this, or I'm gonna send it for you to bring you this. Like I wanted to, uh, I wanted to interview Sy Sylvester Stallone. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's very, very finicky about who interviews him. And um, it's not like, you know, he's just not gonna do it. He's, he's Sylvester Stallone. You know, he's freaking royal. He's Rocky, isn't he? <laughs> he's <laughs> Rocky, he's like, you know. So what happened? So, so I, I said, tell, tell Mr. Stallone that I'll send my plane oh, to pick right. him up and fly him from New York to LA. And, uh, okay, please uh, send it. I, I don't need to be on the plane. I didn't ask to fly with him. I'll send my pilots, they'll pick you up, they'll bring you in. Uh, okay, what kind of plane is it? Like, no. What kind of plane is it? Can I see? Can we see the interior? What year is it? What's the registration number on? So yeah, here's everything. And then he denied it. He's like, I don't need it, but you can interview me. Wow. So so it's it's it gave me a little bit of leverage. Absolutely. I'm not saying people should do that to get an interview, but the, the, the point. <laughs> so, it's, 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 Damon John. I picked Damon John up. Damon yeah. John had missed it. I didn't know Damon. I was trying to get to know Damon. He was in uh, Miami. Miami. He missed a trip. Uh, he missed a flight to Vegas. I called his agent up and said, "I'm going to Vegas today. Tell me, pop on with me." He took me up on it. Me and Damon have been doing business for four years because of that one trip. 
Not just the one trip. One trip, right. and you got to be so right. You got to yeah. you got to hang. You got to. Did it? Did it get in? Get in the plane? Obviously, the, the, the cost involved. It. Did it make you work harder? Did it? Did it make you say, "Hold on a minute, here. You know, this is a big responsibility. We, we, you know, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to no, step it up no, again." No, no, no. You know, when we buy something, you know, it's look. When I buy anything, I can buy two of them with cash out of passive income. That's the only way I buy anything stupid. Mm -hmm. So if it's a watch that I'm wearing, or Anything, anything stupid, and the jet was stupid. It was, a, it's a completely ridiculous, not necessary. I don't have to do that. Uh, but do you really feel that way? The goal is this: like, if you're going to do, so, yeah, was the it. jet stupid? Yeah, yeah it's do you really feel it, that way? It's I completely don't, ridiculous. I don't, I don't ever see that. Whenever I see you on on, on, on social media, <laughs> no, no, you just seem like really happy people that you've oh, got. Yeah. Well, we it's are. Amazing. But, but I love it every time. I didn't. You, you, the question is not whether it made me happy. It's a ridiculous investment. It, it's not. Oh, it's not. Maybe okay. Investment. Fifty million for a jet or fifty million for a building that's worth two hundred million. Like, if you want to make sense of it, yeah. I can find a lot of things that make yeah. more sense. Putting fifty million in a business that already produces cash is worth hundreds of millions. That hundred grand that you pay for that one business is worth a hundred million. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. Okay. okay I get there, your point. There, yeah. the, you can't make sense of a jet. Like, I don't care who's watching this. Like, when you pay fifty million for something and you know in the future it will be worth zero no matter what. There's no way my watch will be worth more money than that jet one day. <laughs> because all jets go to the salvage yard. Right. They, they all end up there. So, yeah. but if I use it right, like we did five, I did five cities in three states in one day in that plane. Wow. To meet customers. That, it, it's buying time. It's a time machine. I'm very curious to know, how did you two meet? And how do you guys have that chemistry to be able to work with each other? Because a lot, a lot of people would envy you for that. We met on a commercial set in Los Angeles. This is how I, yeah. you know, I know there's a backstory for you, but we met on a commercial set in Los Angeles and I didn't really think much of him. I, I was an actress at that time, so I, I knew artists and musicians and actors, but I never knew businessmen. And I saw Grant, I met him. He didn't even register on my radar. Um, but we said, hello, I go home. And a couple days later or the next day, whenever it was, I get this phone call from him and I'm floored because there are rules in Los Angeles. You don't give out somebody's phone number from the call sheet, you know, the list of who's the hot going. actress. Yeah. So the, and so I'm like, how did you get my number? And he was like, oh, the director gave it to me. And I was just floored. I was like, what? Like the director gave out my number? That was like to. such a betrayal. <laughs> anyway, so then we have this phone call, right? And okay, I moved to Los Angeles at 17. So, okay, LA, the guys think that they can buy women. He was kind of like a rich business guy in my mind, you know? Okay. So he found out from my best friend every weekend I was training. I was strength 10th in California of uh -huh. females. I took it very seriously. He leaves a message on my machine and I will admit I'm very superficial at that point in time because he left a message saying I rented the whole shooting range. If you want to go, blah, 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 call me back. And I'm very predictable. He got my interest. I said, okay, I'll be there. Yeah, and but, that's, but that's not that. If I would have done that on the second call, it would not have worked. Yeah. So I, I need everybody to watch it. To, that's watching this to understand. That, it's not just finding true. out what somebody wants. Like this is so popular today. Just find out what people need and give it to them. She, I could have given her ten thousand things that she needed on the second call. She wouldn't have taken them. Nor the third call. Nor the fourth call. It was the perseverance, and not being obnoxious. That's right. Uh, I was obnoxious the first time. I knew it when, when she hung up, I'm like, that was a terrible line. Okay, that was awful. But she will remember I'm the one that said that. So don't kill yourself on it. Right? I and I said, now, now you just need to keep making investments. Because I knew she was the right girl. I moved from San Diego up to LA to meet the right girl and met her the first night. The second part of that question, you asked us how we get along in business. And we didn't have this figured out for the first four or five years of our relationship. And I will say it was primarily because of me and my thinking. I thought I had to be this independent woman that did it all by myself. I didn't want to um, like have a man control me. So I had all these crazy kind of ideas. I didn't even want to make him a meal even though he was my husband, because I felt like I didn't Weird. want to be that stereotypical yeah. woman in the kitchen making my husband meals. Like, that wasn't going to be my life. And then we had a situation happen where the economy collapsed and whatnot. It, 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 
it forced me to have to confront some issues of like, okay, now we have to be a team and I can't worry about all the women's groups that are gonna come after me and, and think I'm some horrible woman for deciding to support and get on the same page as my husband. But in doing that, at that point, we delegated, not based on masculine, feminine, male, female, but based on our actual strengths and weaknesses, we said, okay, you're gonna be the boss of this department, you run it, I'll advise it, but I get behind your decision in this area, yeah, I get to be the boss here. So then we were no longer fighting each other, trying to vie for this power position, because I had my own power. I'm the boss of this department, this department, and this department. So I no longer had to compete with him. Now we work together. And that, to me, in my mind, was the thing that went, we got on and the same launched page. us. It launched Everything. us into we, we, a we had been it, together. It, it just hyper. Yeah. It was the nitro. We had been together four years and we're not on the same page. We were married. It was conflict, we, obviously. We, no, I mean, it, it wasn't. I mean, we just we, we were, were just, just married. Normal. We were just we married. Were just normal. We were just married. Like yeah. we were just together. We were happy. But but when conflict of. hits you, now you got to decide. You can get away with it for a little while. In smooth waters, you can get away with everybody being just kind of comfortable. But as, as soon as you hit rocks and, and you hit problems and you the wind get picks up and the economy crashes, then you're like, okay, you're either going to tear each other apart right. and go down, or you're going to pull together. And we we pulled together. That 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 event, the economic collapse of 2008 pulled us together and said, hey, what are we doing here? And we, that, that was literally eight or nine years ago. Yeah. That's when our whole life catapulted, went straight up. Yeah. Like if you could graph that thing, it's just, when we pulled together and said, hey, what are we doing on money? What are we doing on career? Who's doing what? Who's doing what when? Do we need to talk about it? Or let's just make a decision now. I make a financial decision, support me. I don't go to her and say, hey, should I do this? Mm -hmm. Most couples are having to go talk about it. No. And the I'm moment you talk trust. about it, you lose speed and you leave, lose confidence. A lot of the audience are the people that watch these interviews. Um, I've come to know that uh, you know, they're currently employees, very interested in becoming entrepreneurs, wanting to take that you know, next step, but a little bit afraid. And you were talking earlier about uh, you know, just taking that leap of faith, the turning point to becoming an entrepreneur. So just kind of from both of you, what's your advice to someone who's actually considering being self-employed or being an entrepreneur? What should they be aware of? What calculated steps should they take? I mean, I kind of know what you're going to say, but you should, no, you should answer. Well, I mean, I've heard you say a couple of things. If someone's going to go off and do their own thing, it should be kind of tried and true. Am I right on this? Where they, they, it, there's, what, what do you earn? What do you get from it? Otherwise, the mistake that people make is they think they're going to go off and start their own business and they're going to be the boss and this and this and this. But that it doesn't work like that. Like you still have your customers and people that you have to answer to, and then you end up hating the boss, which is yourself. Yes. You <laughs> preach now, I've heard you say so many times about you can make more of an empire of your own under somebody else's yeah, umbrella. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, Ryan Secco, who yeah. runs Cardone yeah. Capital, yeah. has more of a chance running that whole thing. And, and Jared and all the executives in our company that have really built out their departments. People should look for people to work with. So, so if yeah. I could have been number two for somebody, if somebody would give me an opportunity with a big growing company and a guy was like taking chances and taking risks and willing to spend money, I'd, I'd have been a number two. All I wanted the whole time, my entire life was financial security. I wanted financial freedom. Go where I want, do what I want, stay as long as I want and be paid for my production. And when did you decide to make the move to start working for yourself? You said, that's it, I've had enough, I'm gonna do this on my own. Well, I got fired. So I was a sale, yeah. I was a salesman in a car dealership. I sold more cars there than five other people. But I did it a completely different way. Is that because you were good or they were just really bad? No, it's because I did it a different way. Okay. So what I did was, well, I didn't trick people. They walked in, I said, hey, my name's Grant, okay? You probably don't want to give me your name. Because <laughs> they didn't. Yeah. Like, I don't even want to talk to you. I don't want to touch you. I don't want to talk to you. Is it like that here? Like, no, it's a bit it. different, I think, yeah. when huh? it comes to the car business. You have to queue to yeah. buy a car here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's completely, nobody approaches oh, yeah. you. It's bizarre. Weird. You walk First, around the showroom for 20 minutes, nobody yeah. talks to you. That's what I wanted to say. I remember oh, right. walking into yeah, the showroom yeah. and I was like, really? Is no one going to talk to sell me a car here? Yeah. yeah. Mm -mm. Wow, that's a shame. Well, that happens in America, too. They, they don't wait on you because they're scared of you. Mm. They're scared of that whole meet and greet thing, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 the first part. Mm. Hey, my name's Grant. I think a lot of people are uncomfortable in a lot of industries with that. And then where do I go from there? And I got to get you to like me. Mm -hmm. And I, I approach people like, I don't need to get them to like me. I don't believe that people buy from people they like. People buy from people where I say, hey, this is what I have, okay? That's this isn't about fair. buying me, okay? I have a camera here. 
I have three cameras. One's three grand, one's five grand, one's seven grand. Any of these fit you? Like, do any of these work? Let me know. I know everything about them. And so it was very transparent. Back, back at a time where everything was a little hidden. You know, let me check with somebody else about the price. And so I flipped that whole thing and ended up making a business out of it at 30 years old. When you, when you were first running out, I know you got the whole story about being a car salesman and stuff like that, but you built, you built your- I was your a shoe training. salesman. Did you know I was a shoe salesman? Before a car salesman. Yeah, I always look at people's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> My mum does that. Yeah. So um, when, when, after you sold cars, you went, you went into training. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, you, and you built out a training strategy and you were, you were teaching yeah. de- dealers how to, how to get their sales guys to make money. How, how to get their sales guys to sell different. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and they quit doing the tricks and the manipulation and the tonality. And, yeah. and let me match personality types and cross, cross feet. You don't do that here. Yeah, I guess maybe that'd be the that. doing that. You, you're in the Middle East, man. <laughs> <laughs> the so what, so what, what, what I find with training is that you go into a company, I don't know, they've got, they yeah. got 100, 1,000, whatever, yeah, salespeople, yeah, yeah. and then the CEO says, come in and train my guys. Yeah. And you go, I've got this program. Yeah. And, and they say, well, come in and introduce it, come and launch it. And I know in the yeah. early days, you used to go to those companies, oh, yeah, and totally. you go and launch it, and oh, you'd, yeah. you'd start the training off. Yeah. For me, I watch a lot of people with training, and, and, and there's a lot of people in sales that love the idea of training. Yeah. Love the idea of their company M- paying Most of training, them don't, though. But mo- most of them hate it in real no, terms. No, they don't want... Because it's don't... more accountability. Yeah, they don't want education. They think it's there's luck or something, like something's gonna happen or the economy's gonna be so great or I'm a real estate salesman, so I have a building and I have a showing and I got a listing and I have a business card and I put my photo on the business card and I ran an ad and now something's gonna happen. It's nothing gonna happen, okay? You're, you're gonna meet the fact that you don't know anything about sales other than getting a business card. And so there's so much more to, to that game. And, and part, of, part of the issue with salespeople is they're, they're not, they don't take ownership of the business. I was having this conversation with a guy the other day. I'm like, he's 50, mid-50s. He, he's the guy that supposedly knows how to sell a pen. I'm not going to mention his name. But so he, he's a crook. He's a, he's a complete criminal. I'm like, dude, you got to quit. You got to elevate the game. All salesmen need, salespeople need to elevate the game and start thinking about managing a team, running a business, running a, a big business, not just selling a pen. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that's where the, 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 there's no passion in me selling one condo or one house. Do you think it's too easy? For, do you think it's too easy for people to get into sales as, as, as a job? Could be, could be. That could be part of the problem. Yeah. Now, not everybody has the opportunity to get sales training. Did you get any sales yeah. training? Yeah, I when did. You were coming up. Okay. I spent. Uh, I was. I was a miserable salespeople, uh, salesperson. Okay. Like I was terrible. I hated sales as much as anyone. Nobody ever offered me any education. Though. I didn't. I didn't know it was available. And then a guy one day gave me a tape and said, "Listen to this." It was a little one of those little cassette tapes from years ago. I listened to it. I was like, "Oh wow, there's a way to do this." I had no clue. What do we got there? Tell us a bit more about the book that you've brought with you. Oh, the 10X rule, man. This Absolutely. Is, this, this is the book that everybody knows about. Where, where did that come from? 10X? 10 uh, this, this was after the collapse. Uh, I was working hard. And I'm, I kept telling Elena, what am I doing wrong? I think a lot of people have this conversation. Like, what am I doing wrong? I'm working hard. I take care of my customers. Mm-hmm. I'm fair to everybody. And I can't get ahead. Why can't I get my break? I'm a talented guy. Mm-hmm. I'm working hard, I'm talented, I'm working hard, I'm talented. Like, it was like this, like, and I cannot get, I can't punch through. And then I saw a lot of people that were less talented, not taking care of their customers, didn't have as good a product, that were just flying. And so I sat down, every book I've ever written except for one was about me trying to solve a problem for me. And the 10X rule, I didn't know it was gonna be the 10X rule when I finished it, until, until I finished it. It was about, hey, why am I working so hard and not getting ahead? And the whole the, the premise of this book is my, I, my multiplier was broken. I wasn't multiplying. I was adding. I was doing a little bit more. I was never doing a lot more. I was never doing enough more to, to expand so that I wasn't a slave to my business. I've seen you talk about this before, and it's yeah. really interesting. But for those who haven't been exposed to us, tell us a little bit more in the difference between the multiplying and the adding, because I found it to be very intriguing. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so when you add, when you're when you're running a business, let's say you got a business that's doing three or four hundred thousand dollars a year. I've done that, and then I'm like, okay, all my problems are around three hundred grand, and the two employees, uh, and the few customers I have, 
And so I'm like, okay, this year, my new plan is going to be, I'm going to go from 300 to 400,000. The problem with that thinking is when you're adding 100, you're stuck with all the same barriers. And you're thinking that if you went from 300 grand to 3 million, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I got a different questions I got to ask. Where am I going to get my manufacturing? Where am I going to store my supplies? Who's going to do all this work? All of a sudden everything shifted. When you're going for 300, 400, you're like, oh, you got Sherry works for me and she's no good at this. So I'm going to have to replace her. My, my, my solutions are small. But when you start thinking, okay, I'm doing 30 million, because you'll just keep doing this until you get to 30 million. Now I want to go to 300 million. Imagine the difference. Oh, I need global offices. I got to go to Dubai and make some connections. Oh, I need a plane to go there. Like, you're seeing me just run out this 10x rule right now. Mm -hmm. Like, if people were just tracking what we've been doing, you're going to see us go from 3 million to 6 million, 6 to 10, 10 to 50. Like, we've been doing that. Mm -hmm. And look at all the things that have been added in the last three or four or five years that we weren't doing. You were talking about real estate. Let's talk real estate a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I love real estate. What are you going to be doing soon? You said you're going to OW, you're talking real yeah. estate, the U.S. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, you know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm, I've created a fund called Cardone Capital. And it, it's changing the way people can invest in real estate. So when I was growing up, and even early, in my early real estate career, I could not buy the best assets. The, the best properties are left for institutions and banks. And, mm -hmm. and it's super, super wealthy. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the kind of wealth you, you're familiar with about and read about here. And I'm, I'm not talking about people that have hundreds of millions, but billions and mm -hmm. hundreds of billions and even trillions of dollars of, of available money to them. And so <clears throat> most people, most even real estate professionals get the leftovers, everything after that. And so I've been playing the real estate game for 30 years. And in the last seven years, figured out, OK, I'm going to start buying what J.P. Morgan buys and Blackstone. And I'm going to use my audience on Instagram and Facebook. And I'm not going to go get my money from the institutions. I'm going to get the deal from the institution. And the money is going to come from my friends. And we're going to crowdsource this money without paying brokers. The brokers never like to hear me say this. Mm -hmm. But we've raised $300 million, bought a billion dollars worth of real estate in the last 30 months. I paid not one penny to a broker. Wow. So that means all that investor dollars ends up in the investment. Mm -hmm saving the investor money. And then we distribute cash distributions every single month, not every quarter. Like the banks distribute every quarter or a REIT. A REIT will distribute every quarter. It's funny, you know, people talk about the power of social media and they, they diss it a lot. But then oh. last week, uh, last week, Kylie Jenner, yeah. $600 million, 51% stake in her business. You have raised $300 million through crowdfunding. Now, because a lot of people are wasting time on social media. They're mm, getting likes exactly. and comments. I know there's a guy flying into town tomorrow and he's big on free and don't monetize and and he, he's looking at his likes and comments and i don't look at likes and comments i look at hey i have an offer this is what you could do it's a great deal for you it's a great deal for me it's a great deal for everybody that plays and we want to monetize so i think i'm going to raise three billion dollars. i'm going to i'm going to create a 10 billion dollar fund crowdfunding and then the banks are going to come to me and say we want to buy that thing mm. what what can we see from you guys coming soon Anything we're, in the pipeline? We're, we're going to take a billion dollars worth of real estate and turn it into 10 or 15 billion. That's 10x. Um, now, hold on. You said before that you might be interested in investing outside of the US. Yeah, we, we would definitely. Okay, I mean, so we're, we're, 15, we're right now. We're right now. Have you sat down and said, do you know what? This is where there's opportunities. Uh, well, I'll start studying places. Like, we've been to Singapore. So just look at where I've gone. Yeah, Dubai, Singapore. Like, just think, look, look at some of the places I've visited, right? So I look at real estate everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell you, like, Everywhere we go, we go to Singapore. I'm like, uh, I'm gonna go buy the whole United States of America. <laughs> happens to uh, I come to Dubai. It, it, is yes, to US. it looks like I, U.S. is on sale. I go to London. I I'm just like, want to buy. It gives us confidence yeah. and certainty. I was working two deals when we were in London, and I called home and said, "Just give them the money." Like we were like a couple million dollars away on both deals. Just call them up and say, "We're we're done. We'll give give them the money," because. The prices there compared to the prices here, you, you, the, the, US, the U.S. is probably the cheapest real mm -hmm. estate in the world today. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a friend here in the audience who was classified as a number one real estate firm for three years in a row by the government of Dubai. And I'm sure he's going to want me to ask you this. Yeah. What are your thoughts currently on the Dubai or UAE real estate market? Well, you got supply problems right now. You know? okay. you, or, or demand. You got one of the two. 
it's either too much supply or too little demand. So, so somebody's going to have to change the demand, and and there the, you can see the commitment to that. You know, the 2020 Expo. It's like when we come here, I like it's refreshing to me to see a straight road done in three months, or uh, buildings pop up in under three years. That that would take 15 years in America, which puts America at a massive disadvantage. Unless you're one of these patriotic Americans that are blind and can't see the possibility in other places. Because Americans are, we are hypnotized quite a bit. And we're not very global. Right. We're Americans. That's, yeah. And, and so we went to Singapore, had the same experience in Singapore. Whoa, wow, man, there's control here. Control's oh, yeah. a good thing. Order, if you're running order a business. Order is a good thing. Yeah. If you're running a business and you're running a family, control is good to have. That You want some control so that people know what the, 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 the rules are. They know that. Mm. But to answer the, the other part of the, the real estate thing, we, we buy real estate that cash flows. So some of what people want to show me here, I'm like, is there any cash flow? I'm always buying cash flow. Mm -hmm. So I'm not buying possibility. I'm not buying, okay, we're going to speculate and make a bunch of money here. Mm -mm. Does it cash flow next month? Because I want cash flow. Cash flow is the holy grail of a business. It's, it's why people, the, the great real estate investors or even the great stock investors or company investors, typically invest in cash flow companies. Warren Buffett is famous for everything cash flows. I heard you once talk about cash being an asset or not being an asset. Yeah. What are your thoughts on cash? Cash is just junk. It's trash. Get okay. rid of it as fast as you can. Replace it with cash flow. So I want to take cash. I want to trade it in for an asset, but I got to have the, I got to have the drip that comes from it. So I don't want to trade cash for an asset like a jet that, that needs multiply. to be fed more. Uh, or a house, a house has to be fed, right? So what I want to do is I want to trade my cash. We rent where we live and we own everything we can rent mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. So my rental income from my investments pays for where we live. Have you ever been a fan of being the underdog? We are I've been the underdog my whole life. We're still talking? the underdog. No, I don't want to be. I don't want to be an underdog anymore. I'm ready to be the victor. Me too. I'm ready for my break. We say this all the time. What do we say? When are we going to make it? When are we going to finally make it? So you when consider do we get yourselves our as you no, haven't we're... made it? No, for sure. And we yes, I feel like we have hit a point statistically where people could consider that we have made it, and we have. We 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 have financial freedom to do what we want when we want. So yes. When you still However, get detained by customs. When, and they don't know you who you are, you haven't made it. Because our goal you know, is to reach God 7 billion life. people of the planet. I got so. <laughs> what would you guys consider making it? Reaching 7 billion people on the planet, yeah. handling the financial illiteracy on the planet, yeah, yeah. restoring the family and, 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 and relationship value yeah, core yeah, yeah. to mankind. If we could pull something like that off, I might go take off on a yacht for a few months. But you know, I, you know, I, I have I, if, my work cut it, out for me. I, I don't know, think I, there's any days to take off. You, uh, it, it, you know, it, before, prior to 7 billion people, because that's probably impossible, because we don't have a camel. I'll tell you I this can't one. reach every little village, right? <laughs> You certainly have me rethinking my goals and my targets. I thought I had set high and, you know, expectations. And, and that's, so. that's the point of the 10X rule, and that's the point of her book, How to Build an Empire. Because once you build an empire, you're going to have to expand it. Otherwise, you won't be able to keep it. I want to ask you something. I've been meaning to get it. I did it. Can I get that signed from you today so I can For read sure, it? For sure, man. Here's another Stop thing. I promise you, I've never in my life read a book yeah. except for barely The Great Gatsby in high school because yeah, I had yeah, to yeah. just because I don't have the attention span for it. Yeah, well, now, I, I listen to audio books. Let me get you the audio. But I'm going to tell you this. If I get that from you, I promise I'm going to read it and I'll let you know. I don't care done. if you read it. I'm going to get you no, the audio program it, so. either way and I'm going to autograph it for you. So. <laughs> See, you. I prefer to sell or be sold if I'm honest with you. Yeah. 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 That's my one. Yeah. Because you're a salesman. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. What do Thanks. you consider yourself? Businessman. Okay. Not oh a salesman. no, you said something when we last spoke. Yeah. Okay. You you went from being a salesman to being yeah, a businessman, yeah, yeah, and, you, yeah, and then yeah. you def you could define the I, difference. I found I found it to be very. Um, I was trapped in a salesman's body. I got trapped. He 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 suffers from the same thing. I got trapped. I, everything to me looked like a sale, like a close, a sale, an objection, a handling. A, how, how am I gonna? And then one day I'm like, dude, you cannot. You cannot, you got to become a businessman. At some point, you got to start thinking about, like, I, I, we have 350 employees. I ran with three employees for 20 years because my thinking was too small. And I was thinking, I don't want people. I don't want to manage people. Well, look, if you get 1,000 employees, you don't have to manage them. 
Now I'm thinking about uh, Ryan Secco that works with me. He's like, Grant, you're going to have a thousand employees. I'm like, oh, wow, that would be honorable. So I want to be a businessman. I want to be a legitimate, not a little businessman. I want to employ a lot of people. Are we going to expect you to come back to the region anytime soon? For sure. We never do anything once, mm -hmm. ever. That's one of our policies. Would you come back again? For, For sure. Here? For back here? To Dubai and here. To you the mean studios. to this interview? Absolutely. I don't know about the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I really enjoyed having See, you on the I, show. I, know. I mean, I'd come really back and do an interview with you for sure. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. Appreciate it. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. What a wonderful time spent with these lovely people. Thank you very much uh, to Spencer for being here. Grant and Elena Cardone, we had a wonderful time. We certainly look forward to having you here once more in Dubai at our studios. And make sure you tune in to the next episode. This is Omar signing off. We'll see you next time.